What are the main factors prolonging the Yemen conflict? What are the prospects for peace in that tortured country? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute's interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Moin Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with the renowned Yemen scholar and analyst, Helen Lackner. Helen Lackner is a leading authority on Yemen who has been conducting research and writing about Yemeni politics and society since the 1970s. A former resident of the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, the Yemen Arab Republic, and most recently, the Republic of Yemen, her most recent books are Yemen in Crisis, The Road to War, and the forthcoming Yemen, Poverty and Conflict. A regular contributor to Open Democracy, Oxford Analytica, Orient 21, and others, she is currently research associate at London School of African and Oriental Studies, or rather School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, visiting fellow at the European Council for Foreign Relations, and an associate of the Transnational Institute. Helen Lackner, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I hope um, we'll, others will also find it an interesting experience. I'm sure they will. Uh, and we'll dive uh, right into um, uh, Yemeni uh, issues with your permission. And um, by coincidence, today is the seventh anniversary of the Houthi seizure of power in the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, which in many respects set the stage for subsequent developments in the country and the conflict that continues to this day. Um, in your view, what are the main factors that have led the conflict to persist for this long? Is it simply a case of the Houthis' adversaries' determination and failure to depose the Houthis? Or are there also additional dynamics at work? Well, I think just merely talking about the anniversary may be an opportunity for bringing out some of the complexities of the issue. The Houthis took over Sana'a on the 21st of September 2014 in a totally bloodless event. Why was it a totally bloodless event? It was that because first they were by that time in alliance with the former president Saleh, whom they had been fighting for six wars between 2004 and 2010. So, you know, that's one aspect. And also because the then transitional government of President Hadi that had been brought in by the GCC agreement of 2011 and which was supposed to replace it and develop, a, replace the Saleh era and develop a new, uh, better Yemen. Sorry, this was in the context it, of the mass protests that had been taking place uh, throughout Yemen that year. Yeah, I mean, the protests in 2011 actually went on well into 2012, 2013, 2014, and actually existed throughout the country. I mean, that's another very interesting issue which we might be able to go into. But basically, by the end of 2014, President Hadi allowed the Houthis to take over, because by that time, he was hoping to use them in his internal struggle within his transitional regime against the Islah party, the Islah party being this combination of Northern tribesmen and Islamists of a vaguely Muslim brother variety and others. So basically nobody opposed them. So they managed to, take, to move into Sana'a. That didn't mean they automatically and instantly took over the, the country, but that did confirm the strength of their position in significant parts of it. And to get to the second half of your question, this allowed them to expand their power and their control well beyond Sana'a to basically most of the, of the kind of highland areas of, of, Yemen, of Northern Yemen, mm -hmm. up down to about Yarim. I'm sorry, we, I should have brought a map to put that, make these things clear. But in any case that, you know, that allowed them to develop their power. And by January 15, at that, that point, uh, President Hadi was put under house arrest and then departed to Aden, where, which he set up at that point as, um, as an interim. Um, this is the capital, capital. of, of uh, southern uh, Yemen. Yeah, that had been the capital of the PDRY oh, and previously 
uh, of the British protectorates. Mm. Um, but ba and so basically it had had an official role as economic capital in the Republic of Yemen, a, a role which really was more a paper issue than a real one. Mm -hmm. So you're asking, you know, why, you know, why have the anti-Houthis failed to depose the Houthis today? And that's due to a whole host of reasons. I mean, one of them is that on the one hand, the Houthis are extremely determined and developed a strong military capacity between 2004 and the following, in the following 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, a second element is that they are effectively united and operating as a single unit, regardless of any internal political di divergences which might emerge at a different stage. And sorry, <clears throat> and most importantly, um, the the divisions amongst the and the anti Houthi front. So basically, the Houthis are united. The people against them are divided and are quite incapable of organizing a you know a systematic, for example, simultaneously set of attacks on all the different fronts, north, south, east, etc. Moreover, the Houthis have a complex relationship with the Northern tribes who are their main military force on the ground, because you have this long lasting uh, relationship between the Houthis who are Sada and otherwise known as Hashemites or Ashraf in other parts of the Middle East, i.e. those who claim descent from the prophet and the tribes. And in the, in the kind of cultural pre, say let's pre-capitalist system, uh, this, these, there's an element of the tribes people acting as the military and the practical force to support the ideological and judicial road of the Sada. So you have an element of the Houthis respecting, sorry, of the tribes people, many of them respecting the, the Sada, and the Houthis are a family of Sada. So I'm sorry, have, this is is this an echo of kind of the pre-revolutionary imamate? Um, well, a lot of people accuse the Houthis of planning to restore the imamate. Mm -hmm. They deny it, uh, but there's no doubt that they believe in a theocracy, whether mm -hmm. it's a theocracy similar to that of the imam period or more similar to what exists currently in Iran is. is subject of theological debate, which I will not go into because theology is absolutely- I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. My, my, my scene, my, you know, area of comfort, as they say in the modern world. So you, but you have a relationship, you also have a situation where for the Northern tribes people, and indeed for a lot of Yemenis, they're fighting against the aggression, the external aggression, i.e. The, the Saudi Emirati intervention. So at that level, you do have a very straightforward shared common objective and interest between the Houthis and the tribes people. They don't like to the what they call the aggression. And so that's another element that brings them together and that you know creates this capacity going on. And then, you know, you have a, an issue that the anti-Houthi front not only has been unable to, to develop an effective military response on the ground, but they are, and, and they are to some extent surviving thanks to the Saudi airstrikes, but they're still, you know, you still have um, a very strong situation where you have two opposing groups, or at least one group opposing a multiplicity of divided groups. So I think that in largely, or it starts to answer your question, if hmm. that. Yeah, and if, if I understand, you're, you're also saying that the Houthis have to an extent been able to expand uh, their base of, of support because they've been able to appeal kind of to the broader national sentiments of Yemenis who might otherwise be indifferent um, uh, to them because they are seen as defending the country against foreign aggression emanating from Saudi Arabia. Is, is, is that a fair characterization of, of, of your point? Oh, yes. I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, a lot of people are, if not pro-Houthi, they're anti-aggression. <laughs> Right. So at the moment, it means that they're on the same side. And I think that's one of the many reasons why the war is continuing. I mean, in mm -hmm. a sense, at this point, you know, regardless of other things we may discuss later, 
you know, the Houthis need this war more than the Saudis, right. because that is one of the elements that keeps them, keeps them and their supporters together. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, you've explained very well why the Houthis have, have been able to maintain their position and haven't been defeated. But then perhaps the other side of that um, question is, well, why haven't those seeking to depose them um, who have consistently failed to achieve that objective, either given up or sought to achieve some kind of political settlement? What on that side of the equation is prolonging um, the conflict? Um, difficult to really address that. I mean, as I said, they are very, very divided, you know, mm. just to make a, a short list of the main forces, you have the so-called internet, well, it's not so-called, it is internationally recognized government of President Hadi. Mm. What is this composed of? It's composed partly of the Islam and their military forces and some of the northern tribal forces mm. uh, and basically a few forces that support Hadi as a personally who is from Abyan, which is a southern governorate. And again, that goes into it. So this is one element. You have on the west coast of the Tihama, you have the forces of Tarek Saleh. He is the nephew of President Saleh and his vision is certainly very different, but he even doesn't officially recognize the internationally recognized government. He just mm -hmm. agrees that they are both fighting in the same, uh, in, with the same, you know, enemy in a sense. And, and he's a former commander of the Republican Guard, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, he's a former, he's a former leader. So he of has military. his own uh, militia, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. I mean, his forces are some of the people who were with him before, but also, you know, a whole host of others um, that have that have joined more recently. I mean, you know, he we're now talking about we're now in getting in. If we consider the war starting in late 2014, we're now about to enter the eighth year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people who were fighting in their 30s, um, you know, 10 years ago, are hopefully retired and um, moved to more you know, peaceful activities. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you have them then, in your, you know, as soon as you start looking south, you then get into the whole issue of the southern separatists and the non-southern separatists. And I, I don't know if you want me to go into that, that now. Well, but maybe maybe I can interrupt you with, with, with a broader question, given that you're laying out the land. Um, uh, you know, it is an extremely fragmented uh, political landscape with with, as, as you've already indicated, constantly shifting alliances and so you know are the main fissures and agendas are they regional tribal ideological uh the product of differing foreign allegiances a combination of any number of these um uh factors i think very much a combination of most of these factors i think you know when one can then start sort of separating them out but really all the factors you've mentioned are relevant I think the, the, the weakest one, in a sense, is the ideological one. I mean, ideologically, the Houthis, yes, as we just said, you know, they are believe in theocracy, they believe in the superiority of the Sada and the right of Sada to rule and that everybody else should do what they say. And that's, in a sense, the main, the main ideological thing. On the other side, you know, the ideology, I think, can almost be reduced to warlordism and prime personal profit, you know, because almost all the groups on the other side or uh, all the leaders, let's put it this way, on the other side, you know, are, pro are motivated by personal profit interest. And there is no doubt that this war, like many wars, is a great opportunity for profits for some people and a great opportunity for losses and despair for the vast majority. So I think, you know, that's, that's, that's definitely one element. You then, you know, if you look, if you're looking at, say, the southern separatists, which does emerge in most conversations, you know, what people have heard about is the Southern Transitional Council. Right. Now, why have they heard about the Southern Transitional Council? If you look on the ground, the Southern Transitional Council have a strong presence in Aden, but then everybody else is there, too. And in a very narrow strip north of Aden with parts of Lahej government, parts of Dailer governorate and very small parts of Abyan governorate to the east. Why are they so well known? Basically because they are strongly supported by the United Arab Emirates. Right. Who have not only given them 
massive amounts of military and political support, but are also organizing a great public relations exercise and they have a whole diplomatic presence all over the place, they have a media presence all over the place, basically thanks to that support. They also, and also they have controlled certain military forces in the area, which are known as the security belts and, and some others. So basically the reason everybody has heard about them is because of this UAE support. Without this UAE support, they would just be one amongst many separatist organizations. And there is no shortage of separatist organizations. And it's also worth mentioning that even if you look at the area within the former PDRY, you also have a lot of people who believe in unity. I mean, if you go back to when unity was formed, you know, in, in 1990, 1990. Yeah. it was, you know, Yemeni unity was the one popular political slogan, North, South and Center. Everybody uh, sorry, and, and this is a unity between the two formerly independent Yemen yeah. Arab Republic and, and People's Democratic Republic. Yeah. yeah, and that happened, you know, it was the one really, really popular slogan. Everybody believed in it and everybody was keen on having unity. You had common people, had families on both sides, people had relationships on both sides. Southerners had been going via the YR to get papers so they could work in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia without uh, needing sponsors. You know, there's a whole series of reasons why, you know, Yemeni unity was very, very popular. And that popularity, you know, was weakened and collapsed basically by 1994. Yeah largely because of the way it was implemented mm -hmm. and because of basically what happened is that Ali Abdullah Saleh successfully ended up ruling the whole of Yemen the way he had ruled the Yemen Arab Republic since 1978. It became kind of an autocracy and, and was viewed as a northern hegemony over the former South. But viewed as northern hegemony, which to some extent is wrong because there's no doubt that Ali Abdullah Saleh had hegemony, but he also had southern allies. He had southern allies amongst um, emigres who'd come back from Saudi Arabia and other places after the socialist period, others who'd been in Sana'a, others who'd been defeated in different uh, of the problems and struggles that happened within the PDRY. There were a number of factional struggles in, in 78 and in 90 and 86 are the two main ones. And they both led to, to exile people at taking being in exile in the YR and these became back and supported um, Saleh. For example, in the 1994 uh, civil war, when Saleh defeated the southern separatists, he did it thanks to a lot of southerners who had emigrated earlier, including current President Hadi, you yeah. know, which explains the fact that he's not necessarily popular everywhere in the south. Yeah. Yeah. And, and is the um, uh, former ruling Yemen, Yemeni Socialist Party which ruled um, the PDRY, is that closely connected with the Southern Transitional Council or there's not much overlap there? No, it isn't. And I mean, basically the Yemeni Socialist Party went through a number of transformations, uh, particularly after 1986, which really turned it into what in Europe we'd call a social democratic party. And right. indeed I'd say, you know, in the current environment, the kind of party many of us would like to see in power. But what happened is that precisely because the Yemeni Socialist Party did not systematically support separation and, and split in 1994 over the, over the attempted um, yeah. se secession and split on various other occasions, it has been enormously weakened and it's now really a very, very minor party mm -hmm. because officially its position is that the Southerners should have the right to uh, have a referendum at some point and mm -hmm. decide on their fate. But there, there is no firm statement saying we support Southern separatists. Right. Therefore, the separatists, although they contain people who were uh, connected with the YSP or whose parents were connected with the YSP, uh, as a party, it, it, I mean, as an organization, and there's other or Southern separatists or non-separatist organization in the South, there are some members of the Yemeni Socialist Party, but overall the party itself is, is very much weakened by, mm -hmm. by this element and also by the fact that Saleh, you know, really basically destroyed it quite yeah. effectively after 1994. Right. Please. Yeah. So, um, 
Well, so so we were talking. You you'd you'd mentioned you know that um, uh, many of let's say the anti Houthi coalition are kind of um, warlords, let's say, who are primarily motivated by their personal um, uh, position rather than any political or or ideological uh, motivations. But you do also have, I think, for example, Al Qaeda in the Arabian uh, Peninsula which is often viewed as a um, ideologically motivated factor in Yemen. Um, and are, would you agree with that? Or do you think that even that is a flag of convenience for particular groups and individuals seeking to increase uh, their power within the Yemeni uh, kaleidoscope? I think it's a bit of both. Mm -hmm. In the sense that there are certainly members of Al-Qaeda who believe in Al-Qaeda ideology. Mm -hmm. But there is also an element that if you look at its evolution since it first appeared, even with different names in the 1990s, mm -hmm. you know, it's had, it's had a long, different groupings within it have had long relationships with, with the authorities, with Saleh. Uh, with other groups, and if you look today, for example, in certain parts of the South, leadership are people who were partly uh, formerly in leaders in Al Qaeda. So mm -hmm. you have, you know, it's not it's not a simplistic matter. I think the important thing to note on this is that really, it's a very much a weakened element. I mean, that's one element where you have to say that the strategies and the approaches that have been taken by the US and the Emirates and others have basically weakened the organization enormously. So it's not a major threat, though the main threat, of course, it presents and has done all along has been to the Yemenis and not to not so much to to people outside of Yemen. And I think that's something that's very much neglected, you know, when we talk about it, you know, outside. Right. Um, but really, it, you know, in the list of Yemeni of priorities for a Yemeni family, um, even before this war started, Al Qaeda would probably feature somewhere around number 20, mm -hmm. you know, after a whole series of other items. And I think today they're probably rocketed downwards to close to number 30, you know, except in maybe a few very small isolated areas. So, you know, this is really an element that's considered much more important uh, by internationals than it is considered yeah. for, for Yemen and Yemenis themselves. And so, and so let's say if, if we were to look at the anti-Houthi coalition, you mentioned um, uh, the Hadi government, uh, the Southern uh, Transitional Council, and then we also have other perhaps uh, more regional groups um, in particular um, uh, provinces. Um, and, and, and these are, these seem to be forces, it's almost working like a kaleidoscope. You know, one day they're aligned and another day they're at daggers uh, drawn. And, and this brings, I think, also into the discussion, uh, the role of foreign intervention in Yemen, I think, you know, what you said about the STC illustrates that very well, that this is an organization whose prominence, if I understood you correctly, is, is very much a function of the infusion of foreign support it has received from the United Arab Emirates. Others would say there's a similar relationship between, for example, the Hadi government and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. So, um, you know, it's it's often suggested that the war in Yemen, or at least as it evolved after 2015, was unleashed by Saudi Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman, essentially to bolster his leadership credentials within Saudi Arabia. Others have um, presented it as Saudi Arabia being primarily involved as kind of a, um, a pursuing a regional agenda as part of a regional proxy war. With, uh, with Iran. So my question to you is how you see the relationship between external and local um, dynamics uh, within Yemen, and particularly if we were to focus first on Saudi Arabia and Iran. Yeah, well, maybe to, to go you know, into all the points you've made, I think there's very little doubt that Mohammed bin Salman, who will henceforth be mentioned by his usual description of MBS in this yeah. conversation, yeah. you know, definitely made a big mistake in 2015. 
And he definitely, as my view, did precisely what you mentioned. That is, he hoped for a very quick victory and therefore, you know, to promote himself as the great minister of defense, future crown prince, future king, etc., etc. So I think there's no doubt that that was his initial plan. But it didn't um, quite go equally, according to the plan. <laughs> yeah, by now it's pretty obvious that that plan didn't quite work out as intended. And so I think we have no, you know, no debate on that on that issue. Um, I think, you know, whether he considered the issue of Iran as important in 2015 or not, I, I can't, I don't, don't want to speculate. Mm -hmm. Certainly later on, it became very much, you know, his, his, I mean, yes, he doesn't want the Houthis in power, but it's not a sectarian issue. It's not because the Houthis are Zaydis and he's a Sunni. The mm -hmm. the Saudis, you know, Sunni, who were even more extremist in, in 40 years ago, I much were Wahhabis, whereas he now pretends not to be a Wahhabi, mm -hmm. you know, they supported the Zaydi Imam versus the Sunni Republicans in the civil war between 1962 and 1970. Which is more of a Saudi-Egyptian uh, uh, proxy war. Yes, at this time. well, that's how it was presented. No. Um, so, you know, you, that the, the sectarianism is not an issue. Um, the, certainly the fact that the Houthis occasionally verbally have claims that they wish to get as far as Mecca, which is clearly not something mm -hmm. the Saudis are happy about. Uh, is 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 another issue, but certainly it was seen, I think, for many years, and probably still is to some extent, as an issue for the Saudis to deal with Iran. The fact of the matter is that, on the one hand, the Houthis are not Iranian proxies. The Houthis do what the Iranians ask them to do if that suits their their existing plan. For example, they declared their responsibility for the attacks on Abqaiq in, in September 2019. These are the Saudi oil facilities. Yeah, the Saudi oil facilities in, in the Northeast, even though it was rapidly demonstrated that it actually hadn't been them. But, right. you know, it served, I mean, why not claim something so big? And so that was it. But on the other hand, if it doesn't suit them, they don't do what the Iranians do. On the other hand, for Iran, the support to the Houthis, however limited it is and however cheap it is for them, is an incredibly easy and cheap way to irritate and, you know, be a real serious thorn or maybe more than a thorn in the Saudi program. So, you know, the Iranian role should never be overemphasized. But it is it is there, and it certainly they've played a role in supporting the, some of the technology that the Houthis have been using in their in their missiles and drones that they are using to attack Saudi Arabia. And, and if I just on this point, I mean one one point that many analysts have made is that the Houthi Iranian relationship has actually been strengthened by the conflict, um, and as a result of the conflict, which was ostensibly at least in part. Um, in order to uh, weaken Iran's regional role. Absolutely. I mean, the Houthi involvement. And if you look back in, in things like WikiLeaks and during the Houthi, Houthi Saleh wars in the first decade of the century, Saleh tried to persuade the Americans that the Houthis were supported by the Iranians. And the Americans said, nonsense, this, you know, they weren't buying it. This is a local and so uh, issue. There's no yeah. doubt. That the you know that the that the Iranian involvement has increased significantly between 2015 and today. Mm -hmm. um, it's increased materially in the sense that you know the, the, the these technological advances are coming from them. I'm not sure that it's increased financially. I don't think I haven't come across any figures, reliable or otherwise, about how much it's costing the Iranians, other than it's pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the, the Iranian involvement has increased, and certainly they are much more present today than they were seven years ago. Mm. So, um, I can't remember. Oh, yeah, well, so basically what you have now is if you take out the Iranian-Saudi issue, you also have, you know, yes, the Saudis support the internationally recognized government. It is because of the, you, I mean, the, the fact that President Hadi asked for their intervention, which is a legal justification for being involved in Yemen. The relationship with the, with the Hadi government is pretty ambiguous. I mean, they're not 
they're not entirely happy about what the government is doing. On the other hand, Hadi cannot do anything without Saudi approval. So there are certain ambiguities and they're much, uh, they're much less significant than the problems that exist between the Hadi government and the second element of this international coalition, which is the UAE. The UAE, you know, support the STC. Yes, we've discussed that. But the UAE has a very stressed relationship with the Hadi government, primarily because one of the major components of the um, IRG is the Islah party. And as I mentioned earlier, the Islah party has a substantial Islamist component. So we're talking about political Islam. Mm. And I think as has been demonstrated elsewhere, and is very clear and in no secret at all, as far as the UAE leadership is concerned, you know, political Islam is uh, even worse than the devil, I suspect. Right. And this is so, another distinction between the Saudis and the Emiratis in Yemen. Yes, because also the Saudis' relationship to Islamism has varied enormously over the last 50 decades. Um, you are, it also, it's, it remains ambiguous. So although they now claim to be against Islamism and Muslim Brothers, they haven't declared Islam to be a Muslim Brotherhood organization. And again, you know, we have here a much more ambiguous relationship and there is clear cooperation, you know, with Islam in, in the military as Islam is the main uh, military element in in uh, particularly in the Maghreb and the Northeast area. Whereas, and that is, you know, one of the fundamental elements of di increasing divergence, I would say, between the Saudis and the Emiratis. Mm -hmm. My personal view is that divergence of the Saudi and the Emiratis are expanding at a, at a global level, or at least mm -hmm. at a regional level. And that- Not, the not just place, in Yemen. Yeah, not beyond yeah. Yemen, I, I, you know, and basically Yemen is the place where it is most obvious and most visible, right. where you actually had moments of the UAE forces, bombing forces supported by yeah. the Saudis. But if you look beyond it, um, you know, you, you have the situation now where the rivalry is becoming much more economic, with the Saudis demanding that uh, companies should settle, have their headquarters in, in Riyadh or in Saudi Arabia if they're going to operate there, which would mean moving out of Dubai, which is exactly. something obviously the Emirates aren't keen about, mm -hmm. you know, so there are other elements of, of this of this rivalry, which are emerging in other places, um, you know, and uh, the situation the relationship with Turkey is changing, I think, particularly if we look at the situation with Qatar is changing a lot, because, you know, I think uh, MBS was very happy to sol solve his problems with the Qataris, I think mm -hmm. one can say that uh, MBZ, Mohammed bin Zayed, was, you know, as unhappy about yeah. that particular agreement. It was dragged there so, kicking and screaming. But, but, yeah. but more generally, what, what would, I mean, I think you, you've, you know, um, it's clear that for Iran, um, Yemen is kind of a very convenient instrument with which to uh, weaken Saudi Arabia or keep it busy with things other than um, uh, conflict with Iran, but what is the what is the Saudi objective um, in Iran? Given sorry in Yemen, given that its initial objective of restoring the Hadi government to power is no, is I think there's a consensus that that is no longer achievable. Well, I think at this point the Saudi objective in in Yemen is to manage to get out without totally losing face. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it's been reduced to. I mean, I could be wrong on this, but I, I don't see any other objective right now. So finding I mean, they a also, way to, of course, uh, they want secure borders. They want secure yeah. borders. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they don't want they don't want any more attacks in their territory. They want secure borders. They want you know a, a reasonable and they would like ideally a regime in Yemen that is re reasonably subservient or right. at least not hostile, which I think is something that they'll be able to achieve simply for financial reasons mm -hmm. in the long run or between them and everyone else, you know, who's expected to be paying for Yemeni reconstruction and who probably won't. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the Yemenis, I mean, Yemen, Saudi Arabia has been involved with Yemen since the creation of the kingdom. You know, mm -hmm. its first conflict with Yemen was in 1934, two years after the kingdom was created not exactly as if it's a new relationship they have been you know they have been very very busy 
uh, throughout the period in a whole host of different ways, economically, politically, you know, socially. You've had very considerable Yemeni migration into Saudi Arabia throughout the 70s and 80s and back and, in and the 90s. 90s and up to today. You know, so so there's a very, you know, it's a, it's a very, very close relationship um, at a whole host of levels, popular, political, economic, you know, social, even even ideological. So so you've you know, you have very complicated issues to deal with that. Right. Um, you know, we often. Um, well, the, the two questions. The first one is, um, we often speak about how the impact of foreign forces that have had on Yemen, and that's, you know, clear for all to see and quite devastating and so on. But if we look specifically at those countries in the region, I think there's also the question of how has, what impact has the Yemen conflict and their involvement in it had upon them. So, for example, you were alluding to the growing differences between um, Saudi Arabia and the United Emirates, or the failure of uh, Mohammed bin Salman um, to present himself as a latter day Napoleon. Um, are these issues that are also having domestic ramifications within these uh, countries? I, I my impression is that in the UAE, the level of repression is very high and people keep their heads down. And I think, you know, the same is very, very true in Saudi Arabia. I mean, the, the repression that MBS has been imposing, I think is probably maybe worse than even what, what existed, you know, many decades ago under this under Saud and Fahad. I mean, if you look at the way they treated the, the left wing movements and the nationalists in the 60s and 70s, I, I, I mean, I don't have the details and the technical knowledge to check, you know, the, the level of repression and torture and compare them with what's happening today under MBS. But I think, you know, they're comparable. And there's a lot of talk that, you know, so people in, in the kingdom are very, you know, tend to keep pretty quiet, I would right. say. Right. Um, and, and there's, I mean, there is also a general tension, you know, there's always been a lot of Yemenis in the kingdom. The Yemenis, you know, have always been treated pretty badly and they don't like it. They are very proud people. They did not, you know, don't appreciate being treated badly. And, you know, and there's still a lot of them there, even though the numbers are diminishing with the new Saudization policies and the difficulties that I integrated into that. But, you, you know, you whether the, the actual war in Yemen must be becoming more unpopular as its cost, which is of course kept secret, is rising and the social services offered to the Saudi citizenry are also diminishing. So I think that's that's again another reason maybe why MBS is particularly is keen to get out. Right. Um, and just a, a final question about the foreign intervention. I've I've avoided so far uh, mentioning, you know, for example, the US and UK role, because I think often Westerners look at these conflicts and make it all about themselves. Um, uh, but in this case, um, there is a very defined role that the United States and the United Kingdom have have been playing um, in Yemen. Is what what is your general perception? Are these um, are these two countries? Have they come to the realization this is a losing proposition and are putting pressure to end this war? Or um, is it their arms sales and diplomatic support and so on that has been a key issue in prolonging this war and making it more devastating? What are your main takeaways from the US and UK um, uh, role in Yemen in recent years? I think they're not totally identical, I think is the first thing to say. I think the, for the US, in, in, for, at one level, they are the same. I think both the US and UK interest in Yemen is primarily counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. Should there be no attempt or a terrorism threat of any description, their interest would drop like a rock. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, you know, that, that's a very fundamental aspect of it. 
And, you know, if you look at the aid programs and the activities that they've carried out in the last two, since the beginning of the century, they're also very much focused in the security sector. So I think that's one point they share. Uh, another point where they now diverge a bit is that the British continue selling arms and happily continue selling arms to Saudi Arabia and are refusing to consider not selling arms, whereas the US under the Biden administration has said it would stop supporting offensive um, hmm. activities in the war. Again, you know, the issue of the definition of offensive, I think, uh, it opens a lot of philosophical yeah. Yeah could discuss so i think you have a, a, a difference i think another difference is that you the brits are more um following the desires let's put it that way to be very polite about it of the gcc states and the wishes of the gcc states for example at the united nations whereas the u.s position is more independent, I think, of the GCC states, and particularly nowadays when there is, you know, clearly a, a serious criticism of uh, particularly the Saudis from all sides in Congress and elsewhere, you have, you know, you have a, a much more hostile anti-Saudi attitude in the US establishment. And therefore, you know, in one sense, you could hope that the US might take a more positive and helpful role, for example, in the United Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you have, you know, again, the two are not identical, uh, but they share certain common uh, points. Right. So if, if we um, now uh, change our focus a bit and look at the humanitarian situation, um, Yemen has now for several years achieved the unenviable status of the world's worst humanitarian crisis. But at the same time, uh, analysts like yourself have been pointing out that there is an even more severe crisis um, that could devastate Yemen over the longer term and imperil its very survival, which is, of course, the, the environmental crisis, specifically regarding um, uh, water supply in Yemen. So what are the main features and um, do you think that these can be successfully addressed? Yeah, I think, um, again, I'll try and split the answer and first talk about the more general yeah. aspects of the humanitarian situation, which, you know, as you've said, has been described as the worst in the world for now four years or so. Uh, I mean, the current, this year's um, UN uh, humanitarian statement asserts that 66% of 30 million Yemenis are in need of humanitarian assistance of one kind or another. 16 million are hungry, 5 million are on the verge of famine. Now, the reason they say they're on the verge of famine is because they all have a both the UN and the Saudis and the official Yemenis have a great a good political reasons for not declaring a famine. And Even have, so, incredible figures. Yeah. And I, I mean, whether and, you know, their estimates and whether they're accurate or not is, I think, not that relevant. What is relevant is that there are millions of Yemenis who are suffering and who are hungry and who and who are dying on a day to day basis. And most people don't die directly from hunger. You die, you get sick and because you're, you're malnourished, you're much more sensitive and you die from the kind of diseases that most of the rest of us would recover on in, in a matter of days. And I think what's really important is that, you know, for example, this year, the humanitarian funding the, through the UN system yesterday had reached 54% of what had been uh, requested. Uh, tomorrow, there's going to be a meeting on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly to raise more funds. Um, we shall see after that what the outcome is. There's Don't also humanitarian breath. funding outside of the UN system, particularly from Saudi Arabia and the UAE, which is going you know, mainly to the people whom they want to support. And that brings up the issue that you know, the humanitarian funding and humanitarian support is highly politicized, regardless of what people say. So there's been a lot of talk and a lot of objection to the fact that the Houthis are diverting funds and diverting goods and, and preventing it and constraining the distribution of humanitarian aid, et cetera, which is true. But the say similar things are happening on amongst the anti-Houthi front. And you know, you have a situation where 
again, you have a multiplicity of agencies. I mean, you know, and you have a, a multiplicity of contracts, subcontracts, 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 so that, you know, you start with the funding at the UN level. And by the time it gets to, to the NGO that's distributing money in the field, there's, a, you know, a significant percentage of the original funds or goods have disappeared on the way legitimately or otherwise. So, you, you know, these are important factors. The final really important thing I want to say on that is that the people in greatest need are the ones in the most remote areas. Now, this may sound absurd and surprising to people who don't know the situation. Yemen still has 70% of its population living in rural areas. Yemen also imports 80 to 90% of its basic staples. Wow. You know, this is because the size of holdings, the quality of things, and, and that would bring us in a minute to the water situation, you know, the production and the income of, of from rural life, from agriculture are extremely low and insufficient to keep the population alive. And I mean, this situ the situation of imports and, you know, was already there before the war. The situation of a high levels of poverty was there before the war. You had 54% poor in 2014. You now have approximately 80%. That's some of vaguely official figure or estimate. Um, so you have, so the people in greatest need are the ones in the most remote places. Yemen is a mountainous country. Remote places are remote, you know, and so a, a, a pickup we're loaded with 10 or 15 sacks of flour or, or rice or whatever, you know, goes through any number of, of checkpoints, legitimate, illegitimate by whoever it is, between the place where the driver has picked up the sacks and the, the remote settlement where he's taking them. And everyone on their way takes a Take their cut, yeah. So, you know, you have a situation where people in greatest need, we don't know about. You also have a traditional culture in Yemen where people don't do what we saw in Ethiopia and in Somalia of people going out on the streets, heading for some undefined destination, hoping for help. You know, a lot of Yemenis traditionally, when things get desperate, get into their houses, lock the door and stay until they all die. So it, it isn't visible, it isn't seen, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the importance of, of, of the humanitarian crisis, you know, is, is not just revealed by those estimates that we see. It's, it's underestimated. It's, uh, the, the, re the reality is very, very much there. So now to get to the other half of your question on the issue of water, as I just explained, you know, Yemen, if you look at the western escarpments and the mountainous areas, this is where Yemen is uh, where you can have rain-fed agriculture, and you have had rain-fed agriculture. You've had it thanks to a massive, high, incredible terracing that's you know made very abrupt slopes suitable for agriculture, and the cultivation of basic grains like sorghum and others that are fairly drought-resistant and solid. But you know, one, you've had a lot of deterioration of these terraces, particularly after the 70s, when you had very high migration to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. And the fact that people with high incomes no longer needed mm -hmm. all this, um, you know, needed the, the hard work and the product because they earned enough money to buy imported grains because they were coming imported and were much cheaper. But you've also had a number of phenomena as such a very rapid population increase. When the country united in 1990, you had 12 million people. Today, you have 30 million. The resources have not improved. The resources are the same as they were. So, and you haven't got an economy that's developed alternative activities. So you don't have, you know, income generating activities for a lot of people. But the water situation, you also have the issue of climate change. You have the fact that you know infiltration of water and the uh, replenishment of aquifers has reduced considerably because of the deterioration of terraces. You've also had the introduction of motorized pumps, which have allowed and, and you know which have allowed the expansion of various crops of thirsty crops, some of them for export like mangoes and bananas, and others for local consumption like gat, mm -hmm. which have you know taken which are basically over extracting the, the use of the water. So at the moment, or prior to the major fighting, but I don't think that's changed very much. You have, you know, two, one third of the 
water used annually in Yemen is not replenished. Wow. And you have areas that are beginning to run out of water. So when the water, what happens is first you move to the village next door, to your relatives down the road or whatever. And when it rains and your wells are replenished, you come back. But after a few years, you move permanently. So you're in a situation where you have an increasing number of people who are uh, moving gradually and moving to where there is water. So that can include increases the pressure on those areas where there is water and therefore you know both socially and politically increases pressure but also increases decreases the amount of water available so basically what is necessary to solve the water problem in Yemen is to have a, a enforced transfer of use from agriculture to domestic use mm -hmm. sorry <coughs> this of course also means that you know, other types of agriculture have to be developed or other economic activities. Sorry, I think I'm going to cough again. <laughs> well, you need Sorry to take that. a sip of water by all means. Yeah. So you have a situation where you know, if you transfer, and that requires a serious state enforced decision making process to ensure that water is given to domestic use and human use and livestock use are given priority over agriculture pumping. Mm. This means challenging those who are most involved in agricultural pumping are the wealthier, bigger landholders. And right. we also have a fairly divided uh, landholding system in Yemen. So, you know, it, it, it basically a very important and significant political uh, decision-making process is essential because if it doesn't happen you're going to first you're going to have people moving more and more from the dry areas to areas where there is still water creating more political tensions in those areas depleting the water further that's and basically urbanization would be yeah, a yeah process yeah, of you're having about forced migration and you're talking within you know, a few decades mm -hmm. where a lot of parts of Yemen no longer being habitable mm -hmm. and their population basically being yes. driven out. Mm -hmm. Not many of them are going to head for Somalia mm -hmm. or Ethiopia. You're still getting more Somalis and Ethiopians coming to Yemen and going the other way. You know, where are they going to go? They're going to go to Saudi, Oman and the UAE, mainly Saudi and Oman, which are nearer. And nothing is going to stop them. Fences, mm -hmm. you know, land mines, when people get desperate enough, nothing will eventually yeah, stop the them. Yeah. So you're talking about a situation where, in fact, you know, serious intervention and political determination to solve the water problem is not just in the interest of what may be about 50 million Yemenis in 20 years' time, but of the neighboring states. So on, on, on that note, and now um, maybe turning to the final section of our discussion, um, what's your prognosis for for Yemen and and the conflict in the in the coming period, and perhaps specifically given what you've just said about the need for effective uh, governance um, and and central planning in Yemen to uh, to meet these existential challenges, uh, do you even expect the Yemeni state? to emerge intact from this conflict? Or will we perhaps see some kind of orderly partition or chaotic disintegration? What, what are your expectations? Well, I'll start with your last point. Um, I think the Republic of Yemen as it existed between 1990 and 2015 is not likely to be the outcome of the current war. I think if, if in the best possible scenario, you will end up with some kind of federal Yemen, which will have maybe some vague relationship to what was proposed in 2014 in that field. But, you know, as I said, vague relationship. Mm -hmm. I think that's in a way the most positive scenario. I think the redividing Yemen across into the 1990 borders, which is what many of the southern separatists are calling for, is a recipe for 
uh, further problems. The fragmentation in the north in what was the YR exists, but is probably more controllable. I think the fragmentation in what was the PDRY is much, much more bitter. And as a colleague of mine used to say about the Sudan, about Sudan, she used to say the Southern Sudanese don't need the North to be fighting each other. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that the Southern Yemenis don't need the North to effectively be fighting each other systematically. So you're, you're speaking that, about regionalism within the South as well. I'm speaking about, yeah, I call it regionalism, factionalism, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look, for example, at the STC versus the internationally recognized government, you can also see the defeated faction from 1986 fighting the victorious faction of 1986. You know, you have factionalism, which is uh, not exclusively tribally based, mm -hmm. uh, but it is factionalism. If you look at, um, I mean, that's one, if, I don't know if you can see this one. Barely. But, you know, this is a tribal map of Yemen, and you can see how many you have down in the south and how more united they are in, in the north. Uh, so, you know, this is not, you have very strong fragmentation now, and I don't think it can be solved um, easily. I think that's one element. I think element about the prospects is that one of the, you know, you have a number of factors that prevent a rapid solution. The primary, first and foremost factor is that the Yemeni factions are not ready to talk. They are either on the Houthi side still hoping that they can win, and here the Maghreb issue comes up. And this on the, is the current uh, focus of, of hostilities in Yemen. In one Yemen. of them, yeah. And but you know, it's in a, it, it's the one that is most me media tied or whatever the word is. And but it is um, you know, it's an offensive the Houthi started in January 2020. I we're getting on for we're well Almost into the years. second year yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it has its ups and downs, and they're still trying for it. And the main thing that's stopping them taking Maghreb City, because they have parts of Maghreb governorate, is simply the Saudi airstrikes, because the bit that separates them from the city is basically open territory where airstrikes are very effective. So, you, you know, but it is, I mean, basically the defeat, uh, a Houthi victory or IRG defeat in Maghreb would be a very, very serious blow to the internationally recognized government. But basically the Houthis are still hoping to win and the other side are still benefiting sufficiently in different ways to you know, not be willing to talk in a realistic manner. One of the reasons for this is the United Nations. The United Nations Security Council voted resolution 2216 in April, 2015, and that resolution was out of date within a few weeks or months of being uh, approved. Yeah. And it is completely, you know, it is totally out of, it's a fantasy world today, if you look at that it. That has been overtaken I mean, by seven years of events. It's been over, yes, but it was already overtaken barely a year after. You know, it has two fundamental problems. One is that it demands the Houthis withdraw to their pre-2014 position. Now, given how much they've gained, it's hard to imagine that any Houthi would take this seriously for more than half a second. And the other thing is that it determines that President Hadi and his government are the legitimate uh, authority in Yemen, which means that a UN special envoy is constrained because officially he or she they've all he's, uh, cannot talk to anybody else because they, these people are officially recognized by the United Nations. So this is a resolution that needs to be updated or you know, changed in some form or other. Now, none of the first, well, the first, the first UN special envoy was there before the war started. So he's so out of it, though, Yeah, though he played quite a role in it. Um, but the second and the third, you know, Ulcech, uh, whatever his name, I forget his name. Um, uh, Ismail, Ismail. Uh, and the third one, uh, Griffiths, the Brit, you know, got nowhere fast. I mean, I think um, Ismail did try. I don't, I think Griffiths used a very, used, you know, very ineffective uh, strategy and presumably 
having failed abysmally in Yemen is, was a good reason to promote him to an even better position in the UN. But the new one, we now have a new UN uh, special envoy who started barely 10 days ago, just over, no, less than yeah, 10, 20 days. No, well, he started on the 5th. Um, he, you know, he is not a Brit. He is from a neutral country. He has Swedish, two years. Yeah, he's Swedish. He's got two years experience as the EU special, as the EU ambassador in Yemen. He has more years of experience of the peninsula in the region. And, you know, he is certainly one of the few rays of hope one has at the moment. Between him and hopefully new and different approaches and initiatives that he would take on the one hand, and the fact that the Omanis are now taking a more active role in, and they are viewed positively by all sides, and the fact that the Saudis really do want to get out mean that there is, I'd say, a hint of possible hope. I don't think the war is going to end this year, um, but I think there might be some serious attempts at negotiations coming relatively soon. Mm. I think one of the major holdups, and I think as I've said more than once in this conversation, are the Houthis, who basically are doing sufficiently well not to feel that they need to engage in discussions. I think the kind of mantra that's been going on forever about there is nothing, no military solution, there's only a political solution, I think is as absurd in the case of Yemen as it is in many other cases. There's right. always eventually a political solution once the military has been solved one way or the other. Right. And, you know, once one, either one side has accepted defeat and the other has accepted victory or they've both recognized that there's a stalemate you can then have a political solution. But saying that there's no military solution when all parties are busily militarily active is, I think, you know, one of those statements that I find extremely irritating, actually. <laughs> well, so, nevertheless, oh, sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, so as I'm saying, I think that, you know, that these are the, the hopes that, that you have now, which I have to say, I haven't had, felt quite so positive as I do now, mainly because of the factors I've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Well, Helen, uh, and just one final point, yeah, you know, I mean, if we're talking about possible uni reunification or restoration of unity in, in Yemen, you really, it depends on three things, the military outcome, the extent of decentralization proposed by in a new single state, and third, the acceptance and role of the external allies, and that's basically the Saudis and the Emirates. Well, um, that's a potentially positive note um, and hopeful note on, on which to end this discussion. So, um, Helen Lackner, I'd just like to conclude by thanking you very much for sharing um, your insights and analysis with uh, Connections. Well, thank you for inviting me. And uh, if any of this helps in any way, the millions of suffering Yemenis to get things better, that would be a great step forward. Well, it certainly, I think, uh, helped all of us understand it uh, much better. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye.